Thanks for tuning in to STL TV. I'm Jade Harrell. During this Black History Month, we like to honor and remember those who've made significant changes and sacrifices in the community for the many privileges we enjoy now. One of those giants was Malcolm X. He left such a great legacy in this nation. Today, I'm honored to speak with one of his daughters, Ilyasa Shabazz, about her father, as well as how she's continuing to carry his legacy and build her own. Ilyasa, thanks for joining me. It's such a pleasure. It's such a pleasure. Well, this is probably a very high season for you, but I'm sure it's mixed with all sorts of emotion. Can you share what this time in this day is like for you? Um, you know, again, it is an opportunity to be closer to our ancestors, to be um, really in, in conversation with God, our creator, the almighty. Um, it's also an opportunity to talk to this young generation and, and to let them understand, you know, the richness of our heritage, of our history, um, the founding of this country. Um, you know, when we think about it, had it not been for our enslaved ancestors, none of us today would have the opportunity to call this land of milk and honey, um, the United States of America, our home. And, and so I think it is for every single American, you know, to pay homage, uh, to those ancestors of ours who were enslaved, the indigenous people of this country, as well as those who were uh, captured and trafficked um, to this country that we, we really, we owe them. And so this is just a great opportunity to remind um, the necessity of what they call today critical race theory. You know, again, an opportunity to encourage uh, compassion, honesty, truth, um, to our young people, to this next whole generation of leaders. For sure. I really appreciate that you connected the land of milk and honey for all Americans to additionally the education of and the honor and debt we owe to our ancestors. You come from one of the most influential people to make those changes happen. Uh, in our time, and as we celebrate this, coming from home, what do you feel we need to most focus on in order to achieve that milk and honey dream that we've been hoping for? Right. Well, listen, my father said in the 1960s, um, you know, he insisted that America live up to her promise of liberty and justice for all. And, and so I think that you know, now is the time we've experienced, you know, this pandemic, a global pandemic. Um, we witnessed a horrific killing of George Floyd. Um, we've seen the subsequent, subsequent killings. And so we understand now when people are saying, you know, stop the violence, you know, let's live together. There are so many wonderful opportunities. Just imagine if we didn't have to focus on justice, but we could focus on the passions, you know, of our hearts. And so I think that, you know, if, if we want to speak to every human being, it is first learning to love yourself. When you learn to love yourself, you learn to love others. If, you know, you, if, if, if you love yourself, you, you have no um, choice but to love others. If we're teaching hate, you know, to hate others, we're ultimately teaching to hate ourselves. And, and, and so I think that, you know, now is really just a, an opportune time to um, ensure that we are instilling the right values in our young people, the values of love, the values of compassion, the values of honesty and truth. Yes. Well, for years now, you've worked on institution building and intergenerational leadership development. Can you explain your focus in more detail? Well, you know, it's like, um, you know, the thing, you, a, a tree cannot grow without its roots. And, and, you know, honoring and celebrating our ancestors, understanding the stories, their experiences, um, realizing the, the, um, the value and the depth of their uh, uh, intellect, support, experience. I think all of those intergenerational 
uh, types of interactions and discussions are very much needed. There's so much that we can learn from our parents and our foreparents, um, you know, and I would encourage every young person to just sit around and look at your parent and understand that they too was, you know, you in their youth, just as you are experiencing similar challenges as you and, and it is really them um, they are the ones that can give us guidance. And, and this new generation, you know, can introduce all of these new um, advances that we have because of, of, of them. Yeah. I wonder, is it a monumental task for you to carry on the legacy of your father, Malcolm X, mother, Betty Chavez, and the rest of your family? As we're looking at the intergenerational uh, hope and building. Uh, how's that for you? Has it been monumental? Um, monumental, you know, I find it um, a way of life. Um, for as long as I can remember, my mother um, would say to me, Ilyasa, just as one must drink water, one must give back. Um, she would also encourage me to find the good and praise it, which I'm beginning to really understand. Now I have many friends calling me, you know, really challenged by uh, our times by the pandemics, by the losses, by the challenges, the personal challenges. And, um, you know, it is a way of life. And I think that, um, you know, looking at my mother, witnessing her husband's um, assassination just in her 20s and becoming a single parent, the wife of a man who challenged a government that was historically unjust, but yet she lived her life, you know, as a Delta, Delta Sigma Theta. She lived her life empowered. You know, she never accepted no or I can't as an answer for herself. She raised six daughters um, with so many obstacles. And, and, you know, her motto was find the good and praise it. Don't focus on the bad, focus on the, on the good. Manifest your dreams, you know? And so... I'm just so grateful to have had this kind of woman as a best friend and as a mother and a role model. I, I'm inspired and moved by that. You know, we are the hope of our ancestors. And as we look now as things unravel and, and I too want to share my condolences for your personal loss and of your sister and your family of last year um, and send encouragement but you all know already ascribed to finding the good even still. Um, but I'm really interested in as well, how we can make that a way of life when so much of what we may have assumed or hoped for is, is uncertain right now. You know, it's uh, the African proverb, it takes a village to raise a child. And, you know, this notion of self-love that again, you know, I'm grateful my mother ensured that her six daughters learned about the significant contributions that women made to the world, that the African diaspora made to the world and that Islam made to the world. So we grew up with a very solid sense of ourselves. Loving ourselves helps us love others. You know, it allows me to see you as a reflection of me. And, and so, you know, I think the, the first part is making sure that we love ourselves so that we can work together to combat um, racism, to combat uh, mass incarceration, um, to combat so many of the injustices that are occurring. You know, are we supposed to live our entire lifetimes, generation after generation, doing the same thing, trying to figure out the same problems? So, you know, we have to look back at some of those uh, leaders, some of those young leaders. My father was only in his 20s when the world learned of him, and he was 39 when he was gunned down. And, you know, all of these young people asking for civil rights. My father came along and said, we demand our human rights as your brother. We demand our human rights ordained by God. And, and, and it's so manifesting this kind of reality, you know, and making sure that we accomplish our goals and that you know, as my father said again, and we're not bamboozled, you know, by these um, fictitious stories, you know, that we have arrived, you know, just because a few of us have, but, you know, that we want to specifically fight injustice, injustice against any and everyone, 
because black power is not exclusionary. It simply says that we want uh, uh, the belief in um, possibility, sovereignty, and power. And then it takes a love of self, a love of your people, a love of your creator and life in order to stand and fight for that. So I am so excited to have you share. We're gonna take a quick break, but Dr. King and Malcolm X didn't always see the eye to eye on the methods to solve those problems. We'll talk about more of that when we come back. And welcome back. I am speaking with Ilyasa Shabazz, daughter of Malcolm X and Betty Shabazz. So as we were talking, Ilyasa, you mentioned that Dr. King and Malcolm X might have seen things more similarly, similarly than we thought. A common idea is that they were on opposite sides of how to achieve and, and overcome the race problems and injustice that existed. What, what is your take on that? Well, first of all, you know, I want to say that our families were very close and, you know, my uh, Aunt Coretta was probably the second closest to us than our mother. Um, they were sisters um, and I'm so grateful that they had the support in one another. And, and it does speak to the necessity of sisterhood. Um, you know, both men had the moral aptitude to make this significant sacrifice for their people, for justice. Um, and both came to truly respect one another and looked forward to joining forces in order to accomplish our goals. And again, it speaks to the necessity of us coming together. My father spoke about that often. And remembering that my father was in his 20s when he first came onto the scene. He was 39. He was still a very young man when he was assassinated. And towards the end of his life, not as though he was an old man, but a very young man, he and Dr. King came together. My father went to Alabama to visit Dr. King when he was in jail, when he wrote this, his famous letter uh, from the Birmingham jail. And he spoke to his wife, Aunt Coretta, and let him know, let her know that he was there as the alternative. If, if the powers that be did not listen to Dr. King, that Malcolm was the alternative. And we know that they did not want that. And so ultimately they got rid of my father and, and then they also got rid of Dr. King. But they both understood what injustice was. They both understood human trafficking. They both understood all of the injustices that existed against any human being, and they wanted to end it, primarily against their own, and of course, anyone else, because we believe in the fatherhood of God and the familyhood of man and woman and sis, you, you know. Yes, I do. And as we all should and can. Ilyasa, thank you so much for joining me today and wishing you continued success in all of your endeavors. For more information about Ilyasa, make sure you visit ilyasashabazz.com. 
And after you check her out, be sure to check us out on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and visit us at stltv.net. Thanks for tuning in. Keep it locked right here to STL TV. Experience St. Louis. Thank <laughs> you.